Got it. All the script. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am State Representative Janet Yang Rohr. I am so excited to be here with you today with my good friend and colleague, Senator Laura Elman, as well as our friend and community leader, Regina Brent. Uh, this is one of the many events that are going on this, this month to celebrate Black History Month. And we are just so excited to be here today with you to, to share some of the work that Regina and her colleagues have been doing with Unity Partnership. Thank you, Janet. And I'm Senator Laura Elman. I'm actually in Springfield right now and really excited to touch base with my Naperville friends, um, Representative Yang Rohr and Regina Brent. Um, I represent Naperville, Wheaton, Warrenville, West Chicago. And I've been a Naperville resident for, let's see, 20 years. And, you know, in these 20 years, we've seen uh, quite a bit of change in Naperville, but I'm thrilled to be talking with Regina, who has been a resident for, for quite a bit longer. But before we get started, um, as Representative Yang Rohr said, this is uh, an event to kind of kick off and commemorate Black, His Black History Month. Uh, February is Black History Month, but you might not know that much about the roots of this month. In the 1920s, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History sponsored what they then called a National Negro History Week, beginning in 1926. They chose the second week of February to coincide with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln, whose birthday is on February 12th, and the birthday of Frederick Douglass. Douglas was born into slavery, and although his birthday was not recorded, he selected February 14th as his birthday. Thanks to the civil rights movement of the, in the 50s and 60s, Black History Week began expanding to Black History Month, mostly first on college campuses, and then in 1976, President Gerald Ford officially recognized February as Black History Month. And, and then since uh, since 1976, each Black History Month has also had its own theme. Uh, so for this year, uh, that theme is Black Health and Wellness. And you know, while, while that typically means um, and, and is typically meant to refer specifically to to healthcare, we thought it was um, really we wanted to take a more holistic pr approach to this topic um, and and talk also about community safety um, because we think that's that's also a really huge part of of health and wellness. And so that's a big part of why we invited Regina Brent, um, founder and president of U Unity Partnership to, to be with us tonight. Now, uh, Regina was born and raised on the South side of Chicago. Uh, she's one of 16 children. And Regina also worked in the Illinois Attorney General's office for 30 years, uh, serving as an advocate and supervisor for the Consumer Fraud Bureau. Uh, she now resides in DuPage County, as we mentioned, and she's lived here for over two decades. And Regina, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Representative. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening with my friend, Senator Elman, and yourself uh, and many others who are watching this program tonight. I'm very blessed to uh, have had the honor of becoming familiar, building relationships uh, throughout this lay of the land. I want to add also that yes, today is part of Black History Month. It's, that's the uh, area in which we're in for the next, I believe, 28 days. Uh, I was at the DuPage County Board this morning with Chairman Cronin uh, while he presented a Black History Proclamation that um, myself and Mr. Ronald Allen was able to achieve back in April of 2016, because I do believe that unless we are acknowledged as a people who has given great contributions to DuPage County throughout the underground railroads, uh, it was imperative that we uh, come together and work collectively with Republicans and Democrats to achieve the first Black History Proclamation in DuPage County. So I'm proud of that achievement I wear it as a badge of honor. And uh, with that being said, 
uh, we moved on to create an, an, an organization uh, in conjunction with acknowledging the fact that we had given great contributions uh, within this area. So I appreciate being here tonight. Regina, that sounds awesome. And you know, um, you've also founded Unity Partnership. So yes. tell us a little bit about Unity Partnership and what's its mission? Okay, so um, I've worked at the AG's office, as you stated before, Representative Aurora, for 30 years. I was an advocate uh, for the people of the state of Illinois. So I had to have an open mind, an open heart. I had to be able to stay down the middle. And with that being said, once we established the Black History, Black History Proclamation, uh, along came all of these unjustifiable incidents that was happening all across the country, not down, not in DuPage County, but just all across the country where uh, there was an, a great deal of inequality, uh, a great deal of injustices, um, uh, lack of diversity, and all of those things were happening. Well, it, something happened to a gentleman by the name of Trayvon Martin. And uh, Trayvon Martin was just a young kid visiting his parents when he was approached by a silverman, a man by the name of S Silverman, who actually uh, questioned his whereabouts. Why was he in a certain area visiting? And this young man was no different than any other, I believe 17 year old who would have a bag of Skittles in his hand with some iced tea, who at that time was killed instantly because this particular Zimmerman, Zimmerman felt like he was trespassing and it was all because of the color of his skin. That was one thing. The next thing happened was Sandra Bland, who was a friend of mine, who was one of our church members at DuPage AME Church under the uh, leadership of Pastor James Miller. Her family lived in Naperville. She was killed down in Texas, uh, found, I shouldn't say killed, I should say they found her hung in her jail cell over a traffic stop which uh, touched us emotionally because she was very near and dear to our hearts. So I figured enough is enough, enough is enough. We need to form some kind of organization out here that will serve as a preventive measure uh, to keep these things from happening right here in our backyards. And so at the, I believe it was February, 2016, is when Ronald Allen and myself, who was my co-founder, uh, who is no longer with us, formed this organization. It was first called the Diversity Institute, but diversity could mean anything. Uh, there's many different definitions for diversity. So what we wanted to have was an organization that could bring a collective uh, group of people together, no matter the color, the race, the gender, um, we wanted to make sure that anyone could join this organization as long as we had the same mission goals and future in mind. And so we renamed it from the Diversity Institute to Unity Partnership. That is the reason why it was accomplished and why it was established because we needed to know that we have to build relationships with stakeholders within the area in which we live in order to make change then that's the path we've gone down for the last six years. Regina, I, I didn't uh, realize that that you were um, personally connected with Sandra Bland. And so it, it, it is so wonderful that you've been able to create this organization that, um, you know, that that is there in, in her memory and and you're able to honor her, her memory that way. That, that That's so great. Um, can can you can you maybe talk to us about what what um, some of your your most um, your, your proudest moments and your successes have been so far? Yes, yes, I can. I remember as if it was yesterday. Uh, our proudest moment was that we did achieve the proclamation, which is an acknowledgement. Our proudest moment is that we came together as a diversity group of people. We have Sikh, Muslim, whites, Jews, Gentiles. We have Christians, we have women, men, young men, young women, 
who have joined our efforts over the years, because we do feel like the lay of the land must consist of the people who live in it. And no matter what their race is, um, they are important too. And so our greatest accomplishment is that we have a beautiful and a wonderful board of uh, members who have passion, drive, and interest at heart to make sure that we have a healthy community to live in for all parties concerned, not just one person or people of certain colors, but we, we cater and we welcome everyone because it is not about race, but it is about the human race. Regina, you know, I wonder, bringing people together um, is sometimes hard. What are some of the challenges that, that you've had over the last, you know, as you were beginning or even uh, as you've continued? You know, Senator, I just do believe in my heart of hearts, people want to do the right thing. What we have to ask ourselves is, are we providing the opportunity for that to happen? And when I say that, uh, if you have a disparity of low economics in marginalized communities where uh, mothers don't have babysitters to be able to work, where uh, grown men can't make a decent wage to take care of their families, uh, whereas uh, children uh, who come to school are not privy to the same opportunities such as AP classes, and you don't have the staff that reflects the very group of children that we're teaching, such as African-American teachers, Muslims, uh, Indian, uh, uh, different sorts of teachers teaching our children what is healthy in life, then that prevents us from having a healthy community. And I must venture to say that our other accomplishment is that we have built relationships and partnerships with not only police chiefs, but with government as well. So we have an open door policy to go in, sit down in the back room and the board rooms in order to uh, lobby for what we think is justifiable and what is right. And what is right is that all people are entitled to the same opportunities because each one teach one. And if I don't know anything about your culture, then that's on me because it's up to me when I walk in a room, a room of education, a room of health care, a room of the, of the of government, uh, law enforcement, and I don't see people in that room who look like me, it is up to that body of people to ask themselves who's missing and why aren't they here? And then do the work to make change. And so in order for us to feel welcome, in order for us to trust one another or build trust or relationships, we must have to understand that our needs are the same. It doesn't matter what we look like. It's all about the human race. You know, when, when I hear you, you speak um, about that mission, about your goals, it's, it's really hard not, not to be touched, not to be inspired. Can, can I ask, what are, um, you know, what, what are some of your, your hopes for the future of Uni Unity Partnership and, and how, how can people get involved? Thank you for asking that. That's a good question. I think in order for people to get involved, they have to have hope that things are gonna change. And I blame government for the lack of diversity in many different professions. I think that when we come into uh, our county boards, when we come into our mayoral cities, the village town halls, and there is a lack of diversity, or even in law enforcement, then that is not going to bring us about a good accomplishment when it comes to making us a healthy community. So I'm looking forward to working toward government, whether it's an elected position or just a, uh, uh, an, or non-uniform position. I think that those type of positions should be filled with many different races in order for people to, be, to feel safe, 
and to feel healthy. Without that, from government, government sets the pace about how successful all of us are going to be. It just cannot be a one-way street because I'm telling you now, African-American people, whether they're Democrats or Republican or whatever they are, and how they stand or wherever they stand with their vote or elections or anything else. It's tired of being left out of the picture. We're tired of not being included. There has to be a great deal of inclusivity wherever we live, whether it's in Chicago or the Western suburbs, that has to change. And government can do that with a stroke of a pen. So we must start with government first. In our educational uh, institutions, you know, we have diversity and inclusion representatives, but are we really diverse and inclusive? Because the bottom line is some of those positions can be token positions just to say that they have someone of color on their staff. But if you're not implementing those particular guidelines for what it actually stands for, then there's not gonna be change. And so the people, the community have to take a stand and that is one of the most conflicting things that I feel has happened throughout my experience of leading an organization is that there's been a great deal of a low morale when it comes to believing in the fact that things are going to change. But I study my history. I'm a history buff and I study my history because I gotta have that hope. I know that with very little, the slaves started out with very little, but they hung in there. And during the time of the 60s, Dr. King came along and he hung in there because he believed in change. And without that, if we don't have hope, we cannot have faith and we cannot have change. Can I ask uh, super quick to, to follow up, um, you know, as a history buff, are there, are there uh, parts of history or, or, or times that, that you think that, that maybe are undertaught or that, that you think that, that we should, should read more up on? When it comes to the Caucasian race, I think they already know our history. They're the ones who created our history, which is not Black history. It is American history. Um, I didn't know anything about black history until I got into college. And I venture to say that it is sad to see today that they wanna roll back history when it comes to African-Americans, but they want us to learn Western history, European history. That is not gonna help our children move forward. Our children need to know that we were kings and queens from Africa, that we came from a very rich continent, which was our motherland, that our um, culture was stripped from us, our name was stripped from us, we were separated as a people, and that it took us 400 years before we could be considered to become uh, human. We had to fight for human rights first, then civil rights, then voters' rights. And what is happening today, as I turned on MSNBC, we're still fighting for the same very voters' rights that Dr. King fought for in the 60s. And so it, it saddens me that I am a friend of Dr. King's sister-in-law, Naomi King, who was married to Reverend A.D. King. I just left her 90th birthday party back in November. And it is sad to see that after bombing their homes, after killing his brother, his mother, and killing King himself, that we're back to square one when it comes to equalizing our voters' rights. I don't know what it means to count bubbles on a soap, on a bar of soap. I don't know what it means to make an X. I don't even know what it means when you say to me that I cannot vote or no one can hand me a bottle of water in the line if I'm out there standing in a line for seven hours when I've already paid my dues. The dogs were sicked on us. They sick water hoses on us. They took our men and boys out of our homes because they may have winked or whistled at a white woman. That was Emma Till, who was snatched out of his uncle's house because he had no 
uh, inclination that he could be kind and smile at a white person in Mississippi back in 1953. So I'm saying to you that when we walk and drive and talk and learn while black, when we try to get medical care, mental health, economics, job opportunities while black, we are still having hard times when it comes to equality. And enough is enough. I protested and I marched with several young people. They were not black children. They were 700, 800 strong white children standing up for rights for black people. It's time for a change. And if it means that I have to do this the rest of my life, myself and our board members are dedicated at Unity Partnership to get this done. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off track, but the history of it is the only thing that keeps us going. And that's what we have to know. So yes, it's important that Caucasian people learn about the atrocities that we have had to face over the last 400, going on 500 years. And the only ones who can change this is not black people, but the very white people who caused it. Regina, thank you so much. You know, uh, while I'm reflecting on Black History Month, you know, Black history is American history. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, another thing you mentioned um, that you are friends with Dr. King's sister in law. Yes. You know, yes. that just reminds me too that, you know, we talk about history as if it's in the past. The past is is not really the past, it's still right here. It's right here with us. Um, and that's one of the important things about, you know, celebrating, learning, doing your own, um, you know, learning on your own about the black history, not only, you know, the, the long arc of the 400 years but also individual stories. And even what are those personal stories that, that hit everybody? Yeah. Um, but I, if you don't mind, I'd kind of like to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier. Um, and that was the role of government and representation and diversity within government and in schools and how important it is um, and particularly, you know, I, I think one of the, the great things that Unity Partner has done um, is raising awareness and, um, and highlighting the role specifically of police. Now, uh, you know, so if you wouldn't mind kind of uh, turning your, your lens a little bit on what Unity Partnership has done or wants to do when it comes to, um, to African-Americans, police, and even locally, if you don't yes. mind. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, that uh, statement, Senator. I think it's imperative that uh, we first come together to get to know one another. It is important that we learn about one another's history, whether it's uh, regarding the police department, how it was formed, how it became what it was and what it is, um, we also need to uh, be understood about our own culture, that just because we wear sagging pants or dreadlocks, that we're not heathens and we're not crooks and we're not thieves, we're not robbers, we're not lazy. Um, it's a style like anything else that our young people like to be able to demonstrate within the school system and in their social lives. Uh, we have in the past, in order to build relationships and partnerships, we have given backyard parties and invited chiefs and their staffs to participate. We are also a stakeholder and a partner with Cantigny Park, who allows our uh, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Tyler, every Black History Month and in the month of August, Andrew features Black films there. And he puts on different scenarios about how Blacks are being treated by law enforcement in the past. Now we don't pay police 
with the same brush. Don't get me wrong. We know that DuPage County and many of the quad counties out here have a stellar police department. I wouldn't be living in this lay of the land if I didn't think so. I feel very protected as an African-American person. However, we do know that there are underlying problems within our areas that need to be addressed when it comes to our school resource officers. Normally, when there's a fist fight between a kid, a uh, couple of kids uh, and they're African-American, they get hauled right away to jail. Fingerprinted, mug shot, the whole nine yards. I'm sure you can attest to the fact that we've had active shooters, Representative Roy, who went into the school system and shot up children, and yet they were treated uh, as if they were uh, just children who just didn't know any better or they just had a problem that day, they had a bad day. They had a bad day. And it was a different type of treatment for a black child opposed to a white child. Uh, Dylan Roof went into a church. He killed nine people in a Bible study and he was captured and taken to Burger King for an afternoon meal. When in essence, they would have shot a black kid on the spot for that. So there's a great deal of disparities and we know these things are roaming around in our country. And so what Unity Partnership it tries to be is a proactive organization instead of a reactive organization. And in doing so, we have the backyard parties, we have workshop training programs, how to get home safe. We also have uh, children to partner with their parents to come in and sit about, sit down and discuss the conversation called the talk, the talk. Many parents who are African-American, they are afraid that when their children begin to drive at the age of 16, it really jeopardizes their ability to stay alive because they never know when they may be pulled over and if they could ever return home safe. So we try to do the training with the police departments and the community so that we will know how to get our children back home safely. Now, do we wanna have these conversations for the rest of our lives? No, because it's not normal. It is not normal at all. But I have to venture to tell you today, I am very conflicted about coming back from the county board because as I was there, our minister by the name of uh, uh Dickerson, Pat's, Pastor Dickerson at uh, DuPage AME Church, she delivered the invocation today for Black History Month. And then there was a proclamation presented to a very astute lady who has given great contributions to DuPage County. And after that, I made a three minute public comment regarding no knock warrants and knock warrants and how this gentleman by the name of Amir Locke was killed in Minnesota while lying on the couch in his sleep when there was a group of police officers who broke down his door went in and killed him instantly. That gentleman belongs to my secretary. He is her nephew, the Tyler's nephew, Andrew and Linda Tyler's nephew. They live right here in DuPage County. They're on their way back now to Minnesota because they have to make arrangements for a 22 year old young man who has a clean record, who works every day at DoorDash, and who was there getting rest so that he could start his shift again. And so those stories were, were told to the DuPage County chairman today in the chambers. And I hope that you'll look that up after we are done with this call, because it's imperative to know that that can happen to any of our young children. And so, yes, we've done many things. Uh, my nephew worked for Michael Jordan. He was a designer for Michael Jordan. And he donated Unity Partnership 7,000 pairs of shoes, special shoes that came in a canister that made noise to give a kid power to become Spider-Man or any other uh, active figure that they would like to become. It gave them power. We took those 7,000 pairs of shoes and we passed those shoes out from east of I-80 to west of I-80, from the north to the south of Springfield. We even took those shoes, 150 pair to Pembroke, Illinois. We took school systems, school resource officers and police departments 
and we partnered them with 150 pairs of shoes a piece or even 200 pairs the max so that they could put those shoes on those children's feet, kneel down, look into their eyes and let them know you count, you matter, you are somebody, you can grow up to be a police officer someday. So uh, Representative Roy, you asked, what was the next challenge? The next challenge is for us to bring together all school resource officers in all of these Quad County districts so that we can have a conversation with them based on the fact that you must become the big brother in that school. When they see your uniform, I want them to see your heart first. I want you to give them the inspiration to become anything or anybody they want to be. Not just black children, but all children. Because if change is gonna take place, you're gonna have to start learning how to be a part of it. We can no longer just sit back and say, well, we don't trust the police. I'm afraid of the police. That can no longer happen. We must come out when this pandemic subsides because uh, Representative Roy, that's another uh, challenge that we have right now because Unity Partnership is a hands-on organization. And so it's kind of difficult at this point in time to be in the same room with a hundred people and 30 police chiefs. So tomorrow, our law enforcement monthly meeting will take place at 2.30 on Zoom, and we will have several chiefs on there from different quad counties to continue to talk about the Safety Act. And when you talk about what other success, uh, successful accomplishment we have, when that bill took place, the Safety Act Police Reform Bill, I believe is House Bill 3653, Senator Elman, correct me if I'm wrong, the DuPage County Chiefs and ILACP presidents didn't feel as if they had input in that field. I received a call and I was asked, do you think that you can go and speak to the Senator Sims and the others on our behalf to get us a seat at the table? Well, I thought perhaps that they have more faith in me than I do but I was willing to take that chance because Senator Elman, my lane is bringing people together. I came from a family of 16 children and when a rhetoric hit our home, they asked me to settle it. And so I learned from a very young uh, age that you have to come to people with an open heart, open mind, open ears and open eyes. And we contacted the senators and they agreed that they would meet with them. And so out of that meeting, a meeting was created to go back to the drawing board and to correct all of the wrong terminology, the language, and perhaps to challenge some of the changes. Because I am a sole believer that if I'm going to do the job, I need to be involved in the changes. And so that was one of the biggest accomplishments lately that Unity Partnership was able, able to achieve. And I mean, that's that's a great accomplishment. And, you know, I think anyone who knows you and just, just watching and, and listening to you here today, uh, I don't think anyone should underestimate what you are <laughs> able to do and how you're able to bring people together. Uh, you know, with, with the Safety Act, one thing I found was um, in kind of, interacting with, with the Naperville Police Department, for example, just having one-on-one -on -one conversations with officers. What, what struck me um, was, you know, despite all the, the rhetoric that goes around, especially for, for Naperville, a lot of the things that were in the Safety Act, we, we're already doing. And, yes. and, you know, things like body cameras, things like making sure that we're getting people resources to be trained. Uh, we're, we're doing it here. And a lot of the safety act seems to be like making sure that other people get to enjoy what we enjoy here in Naperville. Um, so just, you know, hearing what you're, you're doing to, to bring the community together here and making sure that others outside of, you know, our world have those same, same experiences is, is so important, I think. Yes, uh, Representative Roy, we have dug deep down in our pockets because we believe in what we are doing and we wanna see a brighter future. And so with that being said, sometimes it costs us financially to 
uh, continue to support our organization based on the achievements and the missions that we uh, took an oath to vow to uh, basically uh, see that we, we, we get done. And so Senator Elman, I propose to the uh, chairman today that for all the organizations that are out here in the community that is working toward equality, justice, diversity, that they get considered including Unity Partnership for some type of grants, some type of funding to be able to continue to put these different programs on uh, so that we can bring about awareness uh, for the sake of the people. There's a question and I hope I'm not getting ahead of your agenda here, but I'm anxious to answer it. And that is, if there was one person from history that you think everyone should know about, who would that be and why? I don't think too many people are not aware of Mandela, Nelson Mandela. And when I looked at a few things on Google today, I realized he spent 27 years in prison. 18 of those years he spent at Robbins Island. And yet this man was able to become a leader even in prison. He spent another seven years at Pulsmore Prison, another nine years, I'm sorry, at Pulsmore Prison. If I could sit down and talk with him today, I would want to know what type of stamina, how did he, how did he deal with, first of all, being taken away from his family? Secondly, fighting for equal justice, but being accused of overthrowing the government. And third, how did he survive all of those years? It was like on a chain gang. It was hard time, but something kept him alive for 27 years to know that someday he would be free. And right today, we're looking at those very same cases when you contact the Sabbath, the um, Southern Poverty Law Center, over and over and over, black men have been incarcerated on false pretenses for nothing, losing time of their lives, not even being compensated right for it, being taken away from their children, their parents, mothers dying without ever seeing them again. And we're still in the era of where a black man or a black boy is not safe in his home or her home, a black woman in her home. And so if I could ever Uh-oh, Regina, did you, Representative Rohr, did Regina freeze? Yeah, I, it, it seems like she has. Come back to us, Regina. All right, let's... Um... Let's give her a moment or two. Oh, I think we lost her, but hopefully she's coming back in. Um, and just one comment on uh, Nelson Mandela, you know, just not only did he spend decades in prison um, in South Africa that was under apartheid, he then was able to transform it and, you know, build it, at least sow the seeds of transformation. It's just uh, an astounding story. Um, so that's, it's just remarkable. So I'm hoping Regina can come back to us. We'll say once uh, while we're waiting for her, um, 
you know, one of the things that that really struck me is just how closely they work with with um, our Naperville Police Department with with other police departments around the the area. Uh, you know, when, I, I think when, when you can build those relationships, it's so helpful. Um, I, I, would, I would highly recommend, you know, one of those ways you can do that is um, National Night Out. I don't know if, if you've been to that, Senator Elman, but uh, yeah. it's just one of those times, you know, um, when you can just, just, just relax, have a hot dog <laughs> with, with one of your local police officers. And it, it's, it's actually, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I was not able to uh, participate most recently, but uh, it does bring out tons of families and, uh, you know, makes a connection to law enforcement that, you know, I think we need. I think what we might do, um, if, if uh, just Re Regina's internet is out. What we might do is just follow up with her. Um, she, you know, as a history buff, I think what what she'll be able to give us is just a lot of really good context on things to read, things to um, uh, just just educate us and, and help us, uh, you know, learn more about some of the topics that she was talking about. So maybe what we'll do is just follow up um, with this this broadcast with just some of her recommendations for for what to go to next to to be educated. I don't know if we'll have to wait representative Rohr, because I think she's coming back to us. Regina. <laughs> Thank you you froze. Are you back. I believe she's not connected to audio. So uh, I'm gonna see if I can help her out. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, while we're waiting, I just wanted to mention, you know, here I am um, in the Illinois Capitol and I am actually located, my office is right in the same end of the hallway where uh, Barack Obama's state senate office was and i was talking with uh, senator collins who's uh, just such a leader um, when it comes to uh, financial institutions reducing the gap in uh, the wage di the disparity in uh, the race disparity in access to capital in wealth and in banking rights and uh, she's actually occupies the the office that uh, President Barack Obama had, and uh, you know, it's just it's just such an honor to to be following in her footsteps as now as the chair of financial institutions, but to watch you know just to see that path of uh, of progression from from Obama to Collins, and I get to at least have a. Uh, a taste of it here. So I see Regina, are you back? Are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened my internet. Just skipped I out think you me. froze, that's okay. You know, you were talking about um, incarceration and, um, and the levels of incarceration for for African Americans, and uh, I wanted you to follow up on that thought, um, you know, because it's it's so important. And um, please continue. Yes. Yeah, so, um, as I said before, we have had many instances where our black men have been incarcerated wrongfully, and it's they talked about. Um, several instances out of Chicago. And the Southern, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center has been very instrumental in reopening those cases, reviewing those cases, coming up with DNA that would free those particular um, victims, I would call. 
How do you make that time up of 30 years, 25 years, going into prison at 17 years old, not knowing what it's like to date a girl, not ever knowing what it's like to go to college, not ever knowing what it's like to stand with your daughter in a wedding or to see your children take their first step. And it's all because of the color of our skin. And so with that being said, it's a good thing that those organizations are out there making a difference in our lives to make sure that uh, those type of instances are narrowed down to uh, nothing practically, but it's so many cases out there, Senator. And that is just the reason why I'm very honored that you have a great interest in what's happening within the marginalized communities, why it's happening, and um, how can we stop it from happening? I think when we look at the system, as I said, over a span of 400 years, we will very well understand why it's happening. And if we don't sit down and have a decent and an honest conversation about what really went wrong or what's really going on now, then we will never get to uh, change uh, for the betterment. So yes, there are those victims that are still out there. I'm on my way to Selma, Alabama. I believe it would be March 3rd through the 7th. That's another thing your audience may wanna look into because I think it's much needed. As you know, we just had 18 or 19 HBCU schools receiving death threats uh, that interrupted class where they can't learn. And it's all because uh, the president allocated funding that was rightfully deserved for education, just so that they can be productive citizens once they achieve their education. And then I heard on my way home today where uh, Vice President Kamala Harris' husband was whisked out of DuSalvo High School located out in DC because they received bomb threats at a black school. This is Black History Month. We should be commemorating those who were in our past, our ancestors, who is responsible for me and even you being where you are today because not only did they fight for racial and equality rights, they fought for women's rights. And so with that being said, we're still in the struggle. We still have to sing, we shall overcome. We still have to ask that question, if not now, when? Once you find a gentleman or a woman who has been wrongfully incarcerated and you know they didn't do it, they're still sitting on death row waiting to be released. If not now, when? It's, it's wrong. And something has to be done about it, but we can't do it by ourselves. The Jewish people have been attacked here lately at their synagogues just because the color of their skin. I had a very good friend, Rita Craman, who educated me the other day because like Whoopi Goldberg, I'm not afraid to say this. I thought the Holocaust took place because of capitalism. I didn't know it was about race. And so perhaps she didn't know it was about race, but she made that statement and it cost her a two week suspension from The View, a very well educated and established woman and who also happens to be a Jew by marriage. Her last name is Goldberg. So I don't think she meant any ill intent. And I'm not afraid to say that because I needed Rita Kramen or Tom Cadero or a Rabbi Mark to sit Regina down and talk to me about your culture so that I can learn how not to offend you, how not to hurt your feelings, and even where I can join forces to be able to make change within their community as well. So I say that to say that everybody should have a seat at the table, whether we are uh, incarcerated or free. 
whether we are the police department or government, whether we're in this teaching institutions, the educational institutions, or in healthcare, we need to all sit down together and have this conversation and come up with remedies that's gonna push us forward. And the naysayers that we are paying too much attention to, we're losing our faith because God is the ultimate here. That's who I depend on for change, for hope, for faith. Not some other creature that was made just like me who possibly had the opportunity to do right, but decided to do wrong. We have to get with those who have the same mind frames, who is willing to see change and who want to see change uh, for the better so that this world, this world, not this nation, but this world can someday answer on judgment day to say we did the right thing. I, I think um, what you said, what, what you're saying really hits home and, and really emphasizes that we emphasize that we don't operate in a vacuum. And it's, you know, when we fight for, um, you know, black rights, we're fighting for women's rights, we're fighting for LGBTQ rights, we're fighting against anti-Semitism. It's all very interrelated. And, you know, we have to advocate for each other. And I think that that's such an important part of the message. And may um, I make a statement about Black Lives Matter slogan? If I had been at that table when that slogan was first created, I would have asked them to add a comma and the word to, T-O-O, Black Lives Matter to. Because when they say Black Lives Matter, they don't mean that no other lives matter. We mean when it comes to Black lives, it doesn't matter in the courtrooms, because if you ever go to traffic court, you will see there are more people of color being victimized and punished for traffic violations than anybody else. And I asked that question with some of my uh, good friends who are chiefs, why is that? And an answer I got did not make any sense. They said, it's possibly due to the fact that white people may have more revenue to spend than people of color. Well, what about the oath you took? What about the oath you took that you would treat everybody equally? So it shouldn't be about revenue or who's disadvantaged or anything like that. And that is the reason why Senator Elman can tell you the cash bail thing is very important. We've had people of color sitting in jail for minor offenses for years without getting a trial. And so now that we have that no cash bail, it is up to the discretion of the judge to make that decision once a person comes before him. And so that's when we say black lives uh, matter. We mean it doesn't matter in the school system. When I'm trying to work very hard to live up to the expectations of the geographic area in which I live, and I send my children to these outstanding uh, school systems that we claim are the best in the nation. But then my son comes back home with a calendar that has a photo on it that doesn't look anything like him, not one child. But thank God we have a chief of Naperville who understands that that is inaccurate and he wants to see change. We also have Dave Anderson, who started out with us on the first day of Unity Partnership, who believed that African-American people should be tweet, treated equally, they should be hired on the police departments, and they should be regarded as citizens to receive the right kind of serve and protection policies like any other race. And he's been with us the whole time for six years. And so, yes, there's hope. And there are people who are still going through major inc incidents. But at the same time, Representative Roy is like you and Senator Elman and others who are having conversations like this. And I hope that in the future that you will reach out into the community and bring in the common people 
who don't know, don't have uh, the background like Regina Brent, um, but also has more experience under their belt when it comes to the injustice. I've been blessed to have worked for politicians all of my life, to be around law enforcement, to know that I'm comfortable in going in a boardroom and a back room with them to see if I can not come out differently than what I went in. Regina, thank you so much. It looks like our time is, is just about up. I can't believe it's already uh, 7.55. You know, um, I want to thank, uh, thank Representative Yang Rohr um, and thank you, Regina. Um, you have always bring a, a perspective uh, that's uniquely your own but also such a, a large perspective. I mean, you always have such a, a broad lens because you recognize how, you know, that even if things are, you know, we might be talking about policing, but we're also talking about representation and we're also mm -hmm. talking about um, socioeconomics. There's, you know, there are so many things that are right here at hand. And, yes. Um, I'm so glad that you're bringing that perspective. Um, I, want, I want to thank you, Senator and um, Representative Roy for giving me the opportunity to have this platform tonight. I'm going to ask all of you that you extend your prayers out for the Tyler family, Tyler, uh, Locke and Wells family as they go through this uh, traumatic experience. Uh, I would like to also give some type of uh, attention to the law enforcement officers who passed away with COVID uh, in Aurora, Illinois, uh, out of uh, Chief Cross District. Uh, two, he, they lost two uh, upstanding officers to COVID. So please keep them in your prayers, their families in your prayers, and many other people who are out here combating situations, trying to get equal justice. I'd appreciate if we stay in prayer about those people. Regina, thank you. Yeah, we will we'll absolutely keep those um, families and um, those people in our prayers. And I want to just thank you again so much for being here with us today and spending your evening with us. Uh, to everyone listening, we want to also extend our appreciation. Uh, if, if anyone has any questions, um, if you have any follow up, um, if you would like that, that list of books that I mentioned, um, uh, we will make sure to post those. And you can always contact me in my office at uh, info at repyangroar.com. Uh, Senator Elman, any, any close, closing comments from, from you? No, I think, you know, I mentioned this before and it, you know, it's just kind of been a common theme for me that, uh, that history is, is right here and alive and, uh, and we're always on the cusp of it. Um, and we've always got it right, right here on our shoulder. So, um, always learning and, uh, learning from each other and making those connections. So um, just want to thank you again. Really appreciate it. You're welcome.